A number of years ago, I was studying with someone on Skype, long before Zoom and other, other technologies. We were studying on a weekly basis, and he was based in Brussels, in Belgium. And he shared with me an interesting uh, story, <laughs> which still brings a smile to my face, but so apropos to what we're talking about today. And that is, he said he was in one of the private schools in Europe. There seemed to be a lot of private schools there, I guess in the United States as well, the elite schools. And he lived in, I think the school he was talking about was in Paris. And he said, you know, a lot of expectations, a lot of pressure for us to excel. It was training us to enter some Ivy League uh, college and university. And remember one day, the word going around the school that a special student is about to arrive that day. Who is this special student? He said it's a person who everyone knew in Europe was thrown out of one private school to another because he was a major troublemaker. He was a disruptor. He would not let a class go by without disturbing. And basically every school got rid of him. He came from a wealthy family, successful family. So they shuttled him from school to school. And now the turn of this Paris school was going to see him. And of course, these kids, he said, we were all excited. We'd love to see a troublemaker. You know, it's always good, even if you, you aren't one yourself, to watch another. Anyway, yes, as planned, he shows up. And he ends up in this fellow's class. Named Richard was my friend, the one I was studying with. He says he's sitting in the class and we're all waiting, anticipating for the trouble to begin. We hear that, you know, he can't control himself. Well, 20 minutes passed, half hour passed. The class was a 40-minute class, I believe. He says, nothing. Guy's well-behaved, sitting quietly, calmly. He said, maybe he's waiting to, uh, to break the ice, maybe tomorrow. Okay, but he wouldn't leave them disappointed. The class ends... About to end, the teacher is wrapping up the papers. He raises his hand. He says to the teacher, this is this troublemaker. He says, you know, I'm a new student here, as you may know. And I've been sitting and watching you and observing and listening very closely to your entire class. And I didn't want to comment until it's over. But I have to tell you, you're a terrible teacher. You don't speak to our hearts. You don't capture our imaginations. You're not in any way engaging. You're a terrible teacher. But there's some good news, he says to the teacher. For free, without charging you, if you come tonight to my home, I'll be happy to give you some lessons in teaching and educating. So you could imagine he was thrown out of the school. Right after that, the teacher stormed into the principal. Such an insult, public, such insolence, out. And that was that, Richard tells me. I don't know what happened with him. Just recently, I decided to Google, see what happened with this guy. We're talking now 20 years later. I thought either he became a major criminal or he became some type of leader somewhere. But he's definitely not mediocre. He's definitely not vanilla, regular. And he, lo and behold, he searches and he discovers. He became the creative director of strategic initiatives at New York Library in Manhattan, in New York City. So I went to look it up. I forget his name. His name was a, not a uh, regular name. I wish I had the name. I look, yeah, I find. And then his job description is, he's always looking for unique ways, innovative ways, out of the box of strategic initiatives for our institution. Now, when he was in school, he was thrown out of one class to the next. And as Richard said, he could have ended up being a criminal. He just did not accept authority, did not accept rules. He broke them all. And suffered for it, I'm sure. But he became, an out of the box, a creative thinker. Imagine had he been suppressed, had a lobotomy been performed on him. I don't mean necessarily physically. I mean it, uh, psychologically, emotionally suppressed. Who knows what would have happened? How many of us is that what happened to us? I remember when I was a teenager. I'm not going to go through all my confessions, but I was not the best student. Let's suffice it to say. I was, not, I was always the guy that, that my friend got thrown out of school, but I always managed to maneuver and let someone else take the fall, so to speak. But we, we made our share of trouble. It was nothing, trust me, nothing radical that would shake you, but it wasn't a regular, uh, and I'll tell you the truth, a lot of my education was mediocre. I wasn't, I wasn't inspired. I wasn't excited. 
I was, as I look back, a rebel without a cause. I had a lot of energy. Who, which teenager doesn't? What do they say? Energy is wasted on the young. But I had a lot of energy. And it was really wasted, I have to say. I, you know, did things that ain't nonsense. I'm not going to say I didn't cause any major destruction. I didn't, was an anarchist in the fullest sense of the word. But waste of time, waste of energy. Direct. But I'll tell you something. In those years, as I was going through my own struggles, and my own challenges, and it was mostly internal. I wasn't particularly a chutzpah dika guy, you know, with a lot of insolence and nerve and, and challenge. You know, I made the trouble like everybody else did. But I was mostly internally. It was far more rebellious internally. It was finally when I did discover a spiritual truth that spoke to my heart like music. Like music. Exactly what, what takes teens is music. Why? Because it captures their hearts and souls. That's what it comes down to. And when I was captured, then it was like a, an epiphany. It wasn't organized. It wasn't structured. I was still a young kid. But nevertheless, it creates the, what we call laser energy. All that powerful energy of rebelling, of um, not accepting the status quo, not uh, going by the laws and authority and challenging and so on, when it comes laser-focused toward a productive end, you can change worlds. Is it possible? Is it possible that we can actually bottle that energy and direct the energy of spirit, of the, the powerful rebellious energy of young people toward positive ends? Or is it this impossible two worlds to meet that once you are seasoned enough and mature enough, you lose some of that um, vitality, some of that spunk, some of that spontaneity that defines youth? So this is an ch- interesting challenge. In my own case, I could say I did waste many t- much time, but at some point I did begin to direct, and it's very much what I do today. I'm still a 17-year-old. And like I always say to people, I'm 17 years old with, um, with uh, just counting with 46 years of experience. Yes. So the energy is there. Um, now, of course, it's a different stage in game, but I'm still in my heart. I feel that way, and I wanted to share that with you. I remember when uh, Matas Yahu, famous singer, uh, friendly, a friend of mine, when he came out with this album, you may know of an album called Youth, it was inspired by my story. It was inspired by the chapter on youth in Toward a Meaningful Life. We actually sat for hours, and he wanted to know the background behind it. So I shared with him some of the background, which I'll share now. So as a, as a rebellious teenager, and I was a voracious reader, I was not buying into the dogma or into any type of structures that I was being told. I always was skeptical nature, by nature. And I always saw myself like I didn't, again, in retrospect, I don't think I had these words when I was younger, but I always saw it like, I was almost like, give me a cause I believe in, I go all the way. I'm an extremist in that sense. Anything but mediocre, like the, the girl comes home from school, she gets a B plus on her marks, and her father says, no, no, no. You either get an F or an A plus. Nothing but not mediocre. Not something, not here, not there. You either fail completely or you succeed completely. Obviously, we won't succeed at everything, but you get the idea. So I was like that type of person. You know, if there's a real purpose to life and something worth fighting for, I'm in. If there isn't, then anarchy. Not because I like anarchy, but what's the in-between? We just want to be comfortable? We want to be safe? That was my attitude internally. And as I struggled with this question, it's not like I had many people to speak to. Because uh, adults, most of them didn't get it. And if, and if I'd really voiced my feelings... Some of us, some of them would reject me or I'd even be excommunicated in a certain way. Definitely in a, an emotional sense where, you know, you're pushed aside, like something the matter with you and so on. And I remember it was, I remember it vividly. I was listening to a talk being delivered by the Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, who became my mentor. The book Toward a Meaningful Life is based on the teachings I heard from this great teacher, who in turn would tell you that he heard from his teachers and his teachers all the way back. Truths that are not owned by anybody. Resonating truths that are enduring and eternal and timeless, frankly. And I remember him speaking about the rebellion of young people. That, the topic on my mind. And it was then the rebellion, he was addressing the rebellion of the 60s. The 60s are known, the rebellion of the youth. Frankly, youth are always have that rebellious energy. But the 60s was a watershed moment. 
the, the, the rebellion against uh, the man with the gray flannel suit conformity post-World War II, baby boom. And there was the whole birth of the beatniks first and then the hippies and that whole uh, summer of love, sex, rock and roll and drugs or whatever order it went. That type of like so-called opening of a new higher experiences. And a lot of it was challenging the status quo, absolutely, and the establishment. And it was a threat to the point that they had the National Guard, Kent State University, there were the, the protests, Vietnam, anti-Vietnam protests. It was a very bloody and very, uh, yes, radical period during those mid-60s and late 60s. The assassination of John F. Kennedy in the early 60s, then the assassination of Martin Luther King, Robert Kennedy, the disruptions in the streets, the racial tensions, a lot of similarities to things happening now, with many differences as well. So the rebel was addressing the rebellion, the rebellion of young people. And he said, I'm paraphrasing, he spoke in Yiddish, the chapter youth in Torah Meaningful Life captures the essence of it. It's my, personally, that's my, probably my, the story of my life is in that chapter. Though all the chapters capture different important themes, but this one was a very personal and really set me in motion it could have gone in very two different, very different directions in my life. So th- this was paraphrasing what he said was, he says, many people would like to have us believe that the rebellion in young people is something that needs to be either eradicated, stamped out. Remember, there were then the, the police in San Francisco, in Chicago, in many places that went to war against the rebellion of the youth, or at best tolerated until they get through this stage this adolescent stage, this uh, awkward adolescent transitional stage. But it's definitely not a positive thing because they're disrupting. They're, they're challenging the rules, the authority, r- uh, laws, uh, in infrastructures, things that, are, that keep a society together. And there were many different opinions, but many saw it as a threat, especially when it became a movement. And the Rebbe said that's a big mistake. The rebellion in young people comes from the fire of their soul, a burning fire, a passionate fire that is not happy with the status quo, wants to change the world but doesn't know how. So, of course, you don't know how. What you do is you just act out. You challenge. You know, when you're a kid, you more or less go along. But a teenager has that capacity, some more than others, obviously. So it would be a grave mistake to try to extinguish the fire of the soul. The objective has to be, if you can't as an adult deal with it, get out of the way. If you can't help. But if you want to help, use your seasoning as an adult, your experience, your wisdom, to help harness this powerful fire, this powerful energy toward a spiritual revolution. Because that's what the youth really want. I was taken by this in ways it's hard to describe. I was a 16, 17-year-old kid. But I was taken because I don't hear those words every day. I didn't hear them from my peers. I didn't hear them from 20 people in their 20s or 30s. Here was a 75-year-old man speaking this way. And I realized that the Rebbe was a true pioneer. He was a true revolutionary. A person who wanted to change the world. Not a conformist. Not someone wants to let's just continue doing the same thing. To change the world like Abraham in his time thousands of years ago, the pioneer, and Moses. And all the great pioneers in history, the men and women who actually changed the world. What did Steve Jobs say? Only those that are crazy enough to believe that they can change the world are the ones that do. This is the spirit that I heard back then. We're talking now in the early 70s. And I began to explore. It was interesting to me. I say, well... You know, I ask people often in audiences that I speak to, how many conformists, how many conformists are there in this room? Anybody that's a conformist, please raise their hand. Do you think anyone ever raises their hand? Who's going to raise their hand? I'm a conformist. Nobody wants to believe they're a conformist. So as a half humorously or full humorously, I always say, so let me report to you, my studies have shown that there are no conformists on this earth, at least not that I have met. Obviously, that's not correct. Most are. All of us have a certain leaning and gravitating toward conformity because then you're, you're not rocking the boat. You're not hurting anyone. People, you, we become pleasers. We become 
make others happy. In the process, we can lose our own voice. And that's what I heard then. It began a series of thinking and actions that changed my life, to be very honest. I am who I am because of those events that happened then. Nothing is overnight. It took time. And nothing is perfect. But I never looked back because I did find my cause. My cause was to find my voice and to help everyone I can meet to find their unique voice. You know, one of my favorite tragic poems, favorite, it's not a favorite, but it captures this so well, is Oliver Wendell Holmes' The Voiceless, where he says, Alas, to those that die with their song still inside them. To die with your song still inside you. Is that not sad? We all have a unique song. And when we're young, it's when it starts emerging. But then people try to suppress it. Or we begin suppressing it, either because we feel we're making someone uncomfortable, or because they don't like it, or our parents want us to do something else. They have a different plan for us. I'm not suggesting a young person has the wisdom to know exactly how to exercise and how to act on that uh, voice. But never, ever burn out that fire. That would be like destroying the very essence of what makes us who we are. Harness it. Teach. I wish education did that. I wish my schooling taught me the passion necessarily to, to, to embrace my voice. Some people combine that line with... Um, with another famous line from, uh, from, from Walden, um, where he says, most men lead lives, th- from Thoreau, most men lead lives of quiet desperation. And they start with their song still inside them. I looked into it, that they don't go together, but it's an interesting confluence of two thoughts. We are not victims of circumstances. We're not victims of anyone. We have a soul that's burning with fire. The soul is actually compared to fire. You have your unique voice doesn't matter how old you are. It's true as we get older, as our arteries harden, so do our attitudes, our personalities, our choices. We become more resigned. We give up. But don't ever give up on yourself. That's the power of youth. We're all young at heart. And some people can be 80 years old, but the the young spirit is alive. And some people are 20 years old, and the spirit is like an 80-year-old. Old, resigned, given up, frustrated. The challenge is how do you harness? How do you direct it toward a mission? A mission that's not about you. So whoever's listening to this, whether you're a young person yourself in those years, or you're young at heart and spirit, or you have a child, or you have a teenager, or you know someone like that, all of us, this is an excellent time because this disruption is disrupting and upending and destabilizing existing systems. So it's a great opportunity to review, revisit, and reclaim ourselves. Yes, reclaim, reclaim ourselves, reclaim our souls. And the key is to find the cause that speaks to you, that's not about your own self-expression, not about your own self-actualization, but about something beyond you. I can say without, as I said, hesitation, it's now years since I was, (laughs) 47 years, 46 years since, those when I was 17 years old. And what I embraced then still lives with me. It's what driving force, why I'm here, why I speak to you, why I share. Everything I'm involved in is based on that driving force, that what? That we all have a unique voice. The whole meaningful life center. Meaningful life. Your life is meaningful because you're meaningful, because you matter. We all would wish that this is the message we heard time and again, repeated again and again by parents from the youngest of age, we would have heard it from, stu- from educators, from schools, from peers, from the media. But you can't rely on them all. They have something to sell. They have an agenda, many of them. So you have to rely on yourself. And that's what touched me so deeply. I wrote the chapter on youth. And when Matisio was doing his album, we sat. I shared with this with him. He actually wanted to see the texts that I was referring to. So we opened them up. And we studied them inside. The texts that talk about that powerful rebellious fire, but like all fire. If it's not controlled, it consumes, it can destroy terribly. If it's controlled, what would life be without fire, without warmth, without passion? If it's harnessed, directed, then what happens? It changes lives in the most powerful way. This, my friends, is what it means to be young. Let us all forever stay young. Let us access that power. 
And yes, let us disrupt in healthy ways, not in unhealthy ways, not, God forbid, in violent ways, not out of anger, not out of frustration. Let us disrupt structures, conformity, status quo, all the things that are just in place have become rusty and are static. Let us disrupt it all with a true spiritual revolution. Spiritual revolution means a higher state of consciousness, that we achieve places that are beyond where we are now, that we are able to think about new possibilities, about creating a better world, about creating a much better normal, and not ever, ever trusting and relying on preconceived norms because they were just there, that's why we just continue them. No, let us challenge them. And that challenge does not mean destroy. There are many things in place that should be valued, many moral, ethical values. But at the same time, everything deserves a new dimension of review, revisiting, replugging, rebooting, and reclaiming. That's what it's about. And may we all have that energy and join together. Because it's sometimes difficult to do this alone. I want to share we are kindred spirits in this youthful revolution. May it be a true revolution that will create a really new norm and it's young people that will lead the way because young people are not trapped by their past. By their past. They have not yet developed into structures and are just givens that are just happening as they are. They are all in a level that is beyond and they're able to think out of the box. Adults sometimes get trapped. We become hardened in our ways, and we don't start questioning and challenging. So let those questions and challenges actually open up new opportunities and new ways to deal with, yes, the COVID-19 pandemic, including all the cultural upheavals of our time, to use this your disorientation and destabilization and uh, this, the, the disruption, all the Ds, and turn it all into an opportunity for tremendously tremendous growth to create a brave new world. We're here every Sunday at 3 p.m. Please share, please comment, please react. This is all about creating a ripple effect, and a real ripple effect of a positive pandemic of goodness and kindness, a true revolution that will transform our consciousness in creating, as I said, a brave new world. Everyone be well. Thank you so much.